Welcome everyone to the Dr. John Yufui Seminar Series. And Dr. John Yufui is sitting right in front of you. Yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, don't know him. Seminar was dedicated to him for all the work he's done for this school. Um, so we, the next talk we're going to have is by our own professor of mathematics, Dr. Marcus Fries. You can tell the speaker needs no introduction. <laughs> so he's going to be talking about uh, big problems. Now we have to be be kind of uh, gentle to him because that's the first time he's going to be using a PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Probably the first time you use slides. The first time. Uh, second time. My thesis defense. I use slides. So if he's stumbling a little bit. But it wasn't PowerPoint slides. So one more thing. <laughs> We're passing these around, and I'll put your name down. <coughs> door prize? Or, uh, <laughs> door prize? Uh, this is extra credit for those that we deserve. Doctor, are you going to make any points for me here? Well, thank you all for coming, and thank you to uh, Dr. Cornelly for inviting me to speak. Uh, I actually had a tough time picking a topic this year, and and I was teaching, a, I'm teaching a course in cryptography for the second time and realized, oh, hey, there's actually a chunk of cryptography that's been in the news lately, uh, Bitcoin. It's an example of what is called a cryptocurrency. Uh, there's currently uh, eight major cryptocurrencies at least out there right now. I mean, Bitcoin is by far the biggest. Uh, second after that is Litecoin. And then they kind of progress from there. Uh, but in the talk, I, of course, I hope to cover what is a cryptocurrency, uh, basics of cryptography involved, and then we'll discuss a bit of the Bitcoin algorithm itself. So, first off, we have to start off, what are, what are properties of money? Right? So if we want to develop something like a cryptocurrency, we need to first abstract what is it that we want money to do. Well, money has to be a medium of exchange. You can exchange it for goods and services. It has to have a unit of account. It's a way to store money or store value. It has to be highly divisible. This is important. It turns out if money's not highly divisible, you run into some issues. Fungible, in other words, all of a similar type or equivalent. In other words, one dollar is one dollar. And one US dollar is one US dollar wherever you go, right? There's not a difference between US dollars. Uh, fungibility is uh, also why art and other things actually don't work as money, right? Um, a single piece of art is worth more than another piece of art, right? A Picasso is worth more than something painted by uh, some J.F. Free. You need a specified unit, right? You need to specify what is your base unit and how is its value derived. And most importantly, it needs to have a store of value. I said that wrong. Yeah, unit of account, I said a store of value. No, unit of account is highly divisible, fungible, and specified unit. And then store of value. You need to be able to use it to store, uh, well, it's really a, a, a way to store your work, right? You work, you get paid in money, you can so save up that money to then get, you know, something else of, you know, a value of work. So you don't have to put in all the work at once. A digital currency. What are the properties we would want a digital currency to have? Security. That's a big one, especially in the online world. Uh, you may have heard about a big password breach recently. Adobe lost 130 million passwords. Um, it's jokingly called the world's biggest crossword puzzle. But if you're going to have a, cur a currency that exists only as ones and zeros as data, you need some method by which you can be the only one who spends that. Right? You don't want someone to be able to create numbers out of thin air and guess what, your, you know, what, what uh, address your currency is at and then be able to spend that. So we need security. We need single spend. This is actually a uh, more difficult problem than it seems, especially with digital currency. Uh, you can only spend it once. Right? Here, it's, it's data. I can copy it and as many times as I want. But if we're going to have it be a functional currency, once I spend it, it has to be spent. I can't spend it twice. Authentication. Right? I cannot deny spending the money 
and the person I gave it to cannot deny receiving it. All right, so basically we need a receipt system somehow. And anonymity. I'm able to send money secretly. Right? The only thing that's listed is my account number or my uh, individual user code, which actually can be changed. Right? I can transfer money to myself, but nowhere is my um, public ID linked with my name publicly. Right? My public ID is just an account number. So Bitcoin actually solves these four problems, which is quite stunning. And it solves them in a rather interesting way. Um, it solves them without a central authority. In other words, there isn't a central single bank that you have to refer to. So all uh, digital currencies up to this point have had to have a central authority, you know, a bank that you had to report to and would track this. Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin gets around this. So a cryptocurrency, a cryptocurrency is a currency that uses cryptography to achieve these main goals. Cryptography, of course, is the art and science of disguising messages. So when you go onto your internet browser and your padlock closes, why is it safe to send your credit card number, right? Why can someone not, why, why do you not have to worry about someone listening in on that channel, right? Someone else could actually get that data and you don't have an issue. Why is that? So a cryptocurrency, we have security, single spend, authentication, and anonymity. The starting point is public key cryptography. Public key cryptography gets its start with what is called the Diffie-Hellman key exchange algorithm. Then there's an algorithm called LGML, followed by RSA, and currently one of the high-end algorithms is elliptic curve cryptography. Um, actually, all of these have been in the news recently, uh, especially elliptic curves. Um, if you've been paying attention at all to the uh, breach of the NSA security. So Alice and Bob want to talk. Eve wants to listen. <laughs> so how can Alice and Bob talk? with Eve in the middle of it, right? There's no way for them to get rid of Eve. So how can they still talk to each other? Well, it turns out public key cryptography has the answer. Alice computes a pair of keys. One she keeps absolutely secret, one she, keep, she publishes anywhere. So you can publish it on your website. Bob does the same. He computes a public key and a secret key. To communicate, Bob downloads Alice's public key, encodes the message, and sends it. Alice then uses her secret key and decodes the message, and she's able to read it. And Eve, in between, is unable to do anything about this. So kind of diagrammatically, we have Alice and Bob. They compute their keys. So the secret keys are in red, and those are kept secret. The public keys are out in the middle. You can see them. They're in the open. Eve, Eve can see these public keys. That's what's fascinating, right? Eve has access to all the public information. Bob takes his message, runs it through a cryptographic algorithm with Alice's public key. That pumps out some ciphertext. Eve reads that. Alice receives it, plugs in her secret key into the algorithm, and out pops the message. All with Eve having access to everything and yet only Alice and Bob know what's in that message. It's quite astounding that this exists. Uh, when RSA, well, it's named after RSA, one is one of the major algorithms, it's named after Rivas, Shimmer, and Adelman, the three researchers who came up with it. And when they first came up with it, they weren't actually convinced that it was secure. I mean, they felt it was, but you know, they couldn't believe it was that easy. It turns out it's not a very difficult problem. Um, and so they published it in a, in a magazine for cryptographers and information people with a bounty of $100, hoping someone would be able to break it, you know, in if they were wrong. Uh, it turns out they were right. It took until 1995 with a distributed attack uh, split across many, many computers on the internet for the key to actually be broken. Cryptographic signature. It turns out public key cryptography, if used in a slightly different way, actually allows us to do authentication of messages. In other words, you can be absolutely certain that I sent a message. 
So we want a verification. We want, Alice needs to know that Bob's the actual one who sent the message, right? Since her public key is, since Alice's public key is visible, Eve could send a false message and say, from Bob. How does Alice know Bob sent the message? There's also a non-repudiation non scheme. Bob can't deny sending the message. That's the other thing the signatures allow for. So not only does Alice know Bob sent the message, Alice can also prove Bob sent the message. We use public key cryptography again. How does this work? Bob generates a second set of keys called signature keys. They're exactly the same type of keys as the public and private keys. He publishes one of them, the B sig P, and he keeps the secret one to himself. He publishes the public one. And now when he takes his message, before encrypting it with Alice's public key, he encrypts it with his secret key. Then he applies Alice's public key and sends the message. Alice receives this. She takes the message, and the message says it's from Bob. It's supposedly from Bob's email address. Well, I don't know if you know this, it's actually very easy to fake any, or spoof an email address. It's not at all difficult. So how does Alice know it's from Bob? She decrypts the message with her secret key. Well, at least the message was secure. Then what does she do? She applies Bob's public signature key to the message. Now there's one of two things that happen. One, the message decrypts normally. Then Alice knows it's from Bob. Alice can also prove it's from Bob. She takes the original message and shows it to someone and says, watch, I apply Bob's public key and it decrypts. Well, conceivably, only Bob knows his secret key. And so that message is from Bob. So if the message is readable, Alice knows one of two things, Bob sent the message or Bob's secret signature key has been compromised. Conceivably though, it's the first one. Bob's actually going to have a tough time convincing anyone that his secret key has been compromised. And as I said, for verification purposes, Alice can show anyone the encoded message and decrypt it with her key followed by Bob's public key. And then that also verifies that the message is from Bob. So that's the non-repudiation piece, right? Bob cannot decide, deny sending this message. And Alice also knows it is from Bob. By the way, feel free to interrupt with questions at any point. Yep? Um, can Alice now somehow use Bob's secret signature key? She doesn't know his signature, secret signature key. She only knows what the one message encoded with Bob's secret key looks like. So she could send that exact message to someone else. Conceivably, they would have to be named Alice. Or, is this, or it's not going to make any sense. Right, so, so there is a bit, there could possibly be some issues in here. Uh, I mean, so really Bob needs to include some very, you know, some information specifying this exact person. Um, and then Alice could only fake a message to another person with that exact name, let's say. Yep? I'm a, I'm a little confused from the, uh, maybe just because I'm not as well versed in the technology aspect of things, but is this like, I'm sorry to uh, compare your wonderful speech to Facebook. But is this something as easy as like, Bob has his password for Facebook and sends a message to Alice through Facebook and she has her Facebook password to log in and like, is it like comparable to that or is this something? It's, it's more than that. Okay. It's more than that. What, do you have an easy like application off top here? Or not application, but example. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. so. Sadly, these protocols have been around for over 30 years and we're not implementing them. I mean, really, if you ask me, uh, information technology security is atrocious <laughs> for, by, by most groups. I mean, it's, it's just an industry problem. People don't pay enough attention to security. It turns out we'll see this in Bitcoin. How about that? The Bitcoin algorithm uses the signature piece. 
Right, so Alice saves the message after, she, Alice applies her secret key and then saves that message there. So it's still encoded, but you have to apply Bob's public key to it. And so it's through this that Alice can prove that Bob sent a message to some third party. So it's kind of cool. Hash functions. Another big piece of the Bitcoin algorithm and uh, uh, technology security in general comes from the use of what are called hash functions. What is a hash function? It is a function which is easy to evaluate. You plug a value in, it spits a value out very quickly. But given a specified output value, finding an input value that goes to that is hard. So in other words, if I have an output value of three, figuring out what input goes to that is difficult. It's also hard to find two inputs that give the same output. So these are just properties we want of a hash function. We're not going to go into hash functions too much. They are rather, I mean, uh, on the face of it, quite complicated looking. And they have to be. I mean, they're easy to compute one direction. They're, most are considered impossible or infeasible to compute in the other direction. Bitcoin uses one of these. It's called SHA-256. The 256 means that the input is 250, or sorry, the output is 256 bits. In other words, 256 zeros and ones in a row. A little bit of history on Bitcoin. November 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto publishes a paper on the internet for a conference called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. There's something very fascinating about Satoshi Nakamoto. Does anyone know? He doesn't exist. We don't know who actually invented Bitcoin. There are some guesses, but as far as I know, there's no definitive evidence of, of the creator. January 2009, the Bitcoin network comes into existence with the generation of what is called the Genesis block. So Bitcoin is kept track of in what are called blocks. The first one of these created is called the Genesis block. November 29th, 2013, Bitcoin hits its record high so far of $1,124.75 a piece. So how does the design work? And this is actually quite fascinating, I think. So, it's a publicly maintained transaction ledger. In other words, it's just a record of transactions that a bunch of people work together at maintaining. And actually anyone involved in the network can take part in the maintaining of this ledger. What's interesting is there's no persistent coins. In other words, there's no coin serial number, blah, 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 blah. That doesn't exist. The way it works, it, well, we'll go over how it works. Well, there's no persistent coins. So the way it works is what you do is you just reference previous transactions that were sent to you. So if I want to spend, send three Bitcoin to someone and I have received two and a half Bitcoin here and one Bitcoin here from someone else, I say I'm spending these two amounts and I send you three and I send myself the remainder as change. So there's no persistent, no persistent coins. All you're referencing, it's just, a, it's just a transaction history. So each transaction is just a giant rabbit trail back to the original? Yes, to, back to its generating block. There's no central authority. Proof of, proof of ownership is given by the majority of the ledgers. So as long as the majority of ledgers are honest, the system works fine. These ledgers are called blocks and blockchains. They are publicly maintained by the users. Any user that is involved can be part of maintaining these blocks. So then what is a Bitcoin? Right, it's a chain, it, now here's the thing. It's a signed and verified transaction. We'll get, we'll get into that a little bit more, but there is a public key signing algorithm that's used in this, right? Because we need to verify that I am actually spending this, 
right? We, we can't just have someone say, oh, I'm going to use this transaction here and this transaction here and spend that. Well, we need proof that you were, in fact, the owner of those. So, yeah, when you go to, a, to spend, you have to reference previous transactions, and then you have output transactions. So it's just a publicly maintained ledger. In other words, it, was, it would be as though um, we had just a big ledger where we didn't have any actual physical dollars around, but we would just ma keep a ledger that we all maintained together, saying, I pay you this amount, you pay me this amount, etc. Of course, how do you prevent faking in this, right? How do you make sure someone's not lying? How do you prevent cheating? How do you prevent someone from writing their own ledger, right? Saying, no, 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 this is what the ledger is. No, this is the ledger. Well, how do you prevent that? So the protocol itself, how does this work? Each unit generates a public and private key. You need to keep your private key private, otherwise your money is up for grabs. If someone gets your private key, they can spend your money or your Bitcoin. So how do you spend a coin? You hash together, so you take the hash function, in this case SHA-256, and you throw into it the new owner's public key and the previous transactions that were sent to you that you're spending. So I take previous transactions that have my public, the hash of my public key in them, I go through, I take those, and I hash it all together, and I get this value it spits out. I sign that then. I apply my secret signature key. So this is where verification comes in, and also non-repudiation. Right? So I apply my private signature key. Anyone can take my public signature key now and verify that I indeed spent those coins. Because if they apply my public signature key, they will get out this hash value again. And they can also compute the ha they can back compute the hash value. Right? They can go back to the blocks, they can pull the data, run it through the hash function, get the hash value, apply my secret key to the given hash value, and those two have to match. Also, I can't deny spending it then. Well, uh, assuming no one's stolen my secret key. Oops. So the protocol diagram, what does this look like? All right, so you take your previous transactions, hashes, and you're paying the spender. So it's paying you, in other words, you, if you are the spender. You take the pays public key, or the hash of the pays public key, and you run it through your hash function. By the way, this hash function is actually arbitrary. The reason SHA-256 was picked is it's one of the most secure ones known. Um, it also has upscaled versions. So we, if, if, if this is ever broken, actually, when this is ever broken, really, there's no if. It's when. Um, we, we can upscale this quickly. Uh, SHA-512 already exists, so the next generation up is already there. I, spent, I throw this in here. Spit, that spits out a hash, and I apply my private key to that, and then I send this out to all other users, and that's my signed transaction. I'm saying, I am, here's what I am spending, and I send that out to all users. Questions? Yeah. So, <clears throat> all of the number of bits in the hash God, too much there. What makes it so special? This is uh, to, the, to the 56 minus 1 combinations. Why can I break that? You'll see why. Oh, 2 to the 56 minus? Uh, minus 1, yeah. As the output here? Yeah, the number of ways you can lay bits uh, using 256 bits, right? <coughs> yeah, but even computing all of those would take you an immense amount of time. Okay. Yeah, um, so let's see. Let's assume you have a high-end system. So for about $10,000, you can build a system that runs at two teraflops. That's floating point operations per second. Let's just pretend for a moment that running the hash takes only one flop. It takes quite a bit more than this. But let's pretend it takes only one. So let's see, tera is 2 to the 15th. So you're able to do 2 to the 15th computations per second. How long does it take you to compute all 
two, all two to the 256 hashes. Yeah. It, it takes an amount of time, amount of seconds longer than there are suspected electrons in the universe. <laughs> so you have a bit of a power problem to begin with. So. Yeah, so, so it, basically these are chosen because with current technology, this is computationally infeasible to actually compute all these. Yep? Because this is all uh, stored on computers, it seems once it is broken, that's going to happen quickly. Like how quickly can they respond to that to protect people's investments? They could change the algorithm in a matter of days or less. Conceivably, but the, the, there would be basically there would be indications of minor weaknesses before a full break would occur. It, it, it's unlikely that a full break would occur simply on its own, right? We'd first get indications that there's weaknesses, and at that point you would change the algorithm. So the ledgers would start to be inconsistent or something. Well, no, that I think that actually happened once. They had to actually back things up because the, the ledgers started diverging. Um, I guess I didn't look too much into that. Like, if you work together, you're saying? Even using the biggest supercomputer in the world right now, which is the, uh, I can't remember, Tiahane 2, it's in uh, China. It, it would still take uh, millions of years, even with that. that. That's how many outputs there are. Uh, but, but what happens is SHA, the, the algorithm for the hash here is publicly available, and so there's all, all the security researchers looking at it and investigating it. And so I, I, I guess I, I would be very surprised if an actual break were ever found before someone noticed a weakness and they changed the algorithm. An, an actual break would be unlikely. They would probably just preemptively change it. Right, they would preemptively, they, there'd be some indication and they would preemptively change it. The writers, the, write, the writers of the Bitcoin protocol. Which, we're not sure if they really exist. Oh no, they exist, it's just uh, <laughs> we don't know exactly who they actually are. But, no, but, but the, the, the algorithm is also publicly maintained, right? The code and algorithm are publicly maintained. So a anyone can go in and look at the source code. Well, some of them we do know. Okay. Um, it's just we don't know the creator. Okay. He is kind of a mythic figure. So there, are, there are people who are standing up and sort of taking Yep. There's some charge of what's yeah. going on But but as I said, you know, there, there, there's there's it's it's all publicly maintained. It's it's all open, right? They they're they're avoiding any secrecy in it. Why isn't that scared of crap out of more people? What do you mean? That we have no idea who created this. Because yeah, I don't think it really matters. Right, since the code's available online and security researchers are able to look at it, no one's found a loophole yet. Well, except for the one that was found this week. Um, <laughs> and, and, and the one that was found this week is actually not a flaw in the algorithm itself. It's a flaw in the way people were using and storing the Bitcoins. Um, so. All right, so here's the thing though. This in no way prevents double spending. Right, as is, we have not solved the double spend problem. So how do we deal with that? So you broadcast your transaction to the network. Transactions are grouped together in blocks every 10 minutes or so. All the transactions that have gone on for the last 10 minutes are grouped together. And then we hash those together with the previous block. So this is happening every 10 minutes. We take all the transactions, we hash them in with the previous block that already exists at the moment. In other words, the previous version of the ledger. Now we need to timestamp this, and we need to stamp it in such a way that it's hard to fake. And more importantly, it's hard to fake something way back, let's say a block from even a few hours ago, to fake it and bring that up to current speed. So um, Then they go with the first one they received. Right. So you, you, could, you could try every you could try to double spend, but what happens then is that the blocks receive it 
the, 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 the people that are mining receive it, and then they take, they compute the block, and then whichever one has majority of, whichever one has majority, that's where you spent it. The other one's then disregarded. But, but this is the big thing, this timestamp idea. This is, really where, this is really where things get unique. And so what we want to do is we want to add in a particular value to get a, an output from the hash with certain properties. And this is what is going to prevent double spending and also prevents people from forging the whole ledger. So they're searching for a value so that when you throw it into the hash, you would have a certain number of zeros at the beginning. Oh. All right, so we're, all the users, all the miners, they're called, are searching for this one value that when you throw it into the hash function with all the transactions and the previous block, it spits out a value with, with a particular number of leading zeros. Now here's the problem. Hash functions behave in a manner that seems random. Really, if you, and this is actually one of the tests for a hash function, is you compute a lot of values and then you plot them, it should look like random noise. And the SHA-256 actually does look like that. It looks like random noise. There are not any easily seen patterns. And this is something researchers look for. So, the, the, so what's fascinating, right, is yeah, so if some value, let's say 17, results in one less than the, the number of leading zeros you need, 18 could have no leading zeros. <laughs> 19 could have one, 20 could have none. I mean, so it, it behaves really in a manner that would to you seem random. So the thing is, once you, let's, there's no, aha, that value is really close, that doesn't matter. <laughs> the value you're looking for may be a long ways off. Now, why does this help? This, the, the growth of this problem is exponential. And this is what prevents people from faking the ledger. Why? So if you want to find five leading zeros, let's say that on average this takes 10 minutes. By the way, in the Bitcoin algorithm, the number of leading zeros changes as hardware improves. So the goal is for it always to take, on average, 10 minutes to find this special value for the hash. So basically, if it starts taking less time, they then up it a little bit, because the goal is for it to take 10 minutes on average. They want it to take a significant amount of time. So if finding five leading zeros takes 10 minutes, finding six on that harder will take 20, finding seven leading zeros will take 40, finding eight will take 80 minutes, right? And so the problem grows and grows and grows and grows. This is what prevents anyone from faking the ledger. Let's say I want to go back 20 minutes ago even and fake a value. Say, no, 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 I, I guess I didn't want to spend that money. I would like that back or I want to, you know, some sort of fraud. The trouble is I have to go back to that point compute the appropriate hashes, and then I have to find this special value. Let's say I'm able to do it in 10 minutes. I then have to find the next value. So this is 20 minutes ago. The trouble is I eventually have to move, be able to move up faster than the rest of the network, because the rest of the network keeps moving. Every time I take a step forward, let's say I'm able to do it in only 10 minutes, the network's taking a step forward. For, so for me to catch up and fake something, I would need an amount of power, computing power, more than that, than the rest of the, the um, honest nodes. This is what prevents anyone from faking the ledger. And this is the really unique idea that came out in the paper in 2008. Is that this is a way of building a ledger that's publicly maintained that, can, that is very difficult to fake. Yes, but then it goes by a majority vote again. Oh. And then at that point, I, I, I guess I, that would be an interesting thing. If you would be able to, what would the network do? I think there is something to deal with that also. Um, yeah, because um, they would also then go by the majority of which transaction was received. 
So if that transaction wasn't received by the majority of users, that transaction would be considered invalid. Catching up is a very, very difficult problem, and that's one of the neat things with the algorithm. So just to, to give you an example of some of the chaotic nature of the hash algorithm, I hashed together some files. I took a file called a.txt, and it contained exactly one letter. <laughs> In the first case, it contained the letter a, and there's the output value. Then the letter b, and the output value. C, D, and E, and you can see that they drastically change just between even the first two. Um, a and B only differ by a couple of bits. So the file itself differed only in a couple places with ones and zeros, and yet the output value varied wildly. B and C differ by only a little bit, and the output value varied wildly. And so this is why hash functions are difficult to predict. Um, by the way, these are hexadecimal values, so each digit takes the values uh, 0 through 15. And so you'll notice there are what? Uh, 32 of them, because that makes for 256 bits. So block creation. The previous transactions, so this is you spending, you take the previous transactions with your public key, you run it through the, ha the, pay the person you're paying, their public key, you run it through a hash algorithm. This outputs a hash, which you then sign with your private key. And this gets broadcast to the network with all the other transactions for that 10 minutes. You take all these, you run them through a hash algorithm with the previous block, so basically, the, part of the point here is that this previous block, the reason we include this is so that someone can't pre-compute. Right? You can't have someone pre-computing what this new block would be because you need the previous block. We run this through a hash algorithm, and we include what is called, and now I don't know if this is a nonce or an n once. I forgot to look that up. Both make sense to me. I would actually go with n once, right, because it's a one-time n value. So it's a single value. Then when we put it in, we get an output with a specified number of leading zeros. And then we broadcast this to the, if we're the ones who find it, we broadcast it to the whole network. We're actually rewarded at the current time with 25 bitcoins for finding this value. That's the incentive for doing this comp computational work. And it's easily verifiable, right? So it, it's difficult to compute this little, this n value. This value is difficult to find, but once it's found, it's actually easy to verify. Because remember, hash functions are easy to compute in one direction. So I, anyone can just grab all the transactions and the previous block and this special value, run it through, and confirm, yes, this is a valid block. This is how blocks are created. This is where the security lies. Or uh, this is the security of why we can't fake the ledger. There's also security, of course, here in your private key, right? That you have to sign these things. So someone can't just spend them randomly for you. Questions on this? So if people have the same uh, if we have the same private key, we have the same public key. But that would be so incredibly unlikely. People aren't allowed to make their own keys. You can, but that's crazy. Go ahead. Uh, what about the 25 Bitcoin reward you said? Is that just for the first person to calculate that? Just the first person who gets it. The first person... Huh? There's incentive to do that. Right, that's why there's incentive. That's why actually I think there's one group that set up a whole set of servers in Iceland just to do this. Every 10 minutes. Every 10 minutes, 25 bitcoins are created. So this is actually how the currency is created also. 
is through this reward system. Um, the reward actually decays. Originally it was 50 every time you found one. It has decayed once now to 25. It will eventually decay to I think 12 and a half and get smaller and smaller as time goes on. Um, so the, the amount of currency released decreases exponentially and also the amount of Bitcoin is actually capped. There is an actual maximum amount that can exist. You store it on your computer. Is there any way with Bitcoin to spend on credit? I don't think so. Actually, I would say no. Yeah, I think so. Uh, can Bitcoins only be used on the Bitcoin server, or is there a way to like, transfer those to US dollars? There's no such thing as the Bitcoin server. Oh, okay. I mean, wherever the, the code is being used, is there a way to somehow transfer that? Uh, there are exchanges that will buy them for U.S. dollars from you. Um, Mount Gox and a few others. Um, so you can, and then the other thing is you can arrange with private citizens to sell them. Um, but there is actually a large, a growing number, not a large number, a growing number of businesses online that accept Bitcoin. And so they have their public key or the hash of their public key listed for you. And so you can actually send them payment through Bitcoin directly. Yeah, so again, that's one of the important things is it's actually completely decentralized. There is no like Bitcoin servers or anything like that. That's one of the unique features, right? Um, it's all just maintained by the users. Yes? So, with how much storage space does the blog take up right now? Thank you. A block is 10 gigs? Oh, the entire ledger is currently 10 gigabytes. And there's methods for um, helping pare down the data so you don't have a data overload. There's, and I, that I haven't read up on much yet, um, but there is, there is already a mechanism in place to um, old transactions that aren't relevant or there's a way to drop them out. Other questions? So a, a single transaction is actually quite small. Um, I saw an example online somewhere. Well, actually, I can show you where in my the sources. Yeah? So does this mean your money is really only as safe as your computer is? If your private key is stored on your computer and created by your computer? Well, it, it, it's created by some pretty good algorithms on your computer, for one thing. Yeah. But someone could get to your car, someone could get to your wallet, some, I mean it's, it, it, you know, you, you eventually have to have some physical security. Um, there, there are quite a few people that have them secured with um, a separate longer key that's stored like on a flash drive or, or there's actually uh, very nice encryption software you can get that has pass phrases. Or you have to type in a whole sentence before it'll unlock things. So you could do something like that also. But yeah, if you don't keep your secret key safe, I mean, it, it would be like it would be like it would be like leaving your bank account number, you know, spray painting your bank account number on the side of your car. You know, if you do that, you you have other issues. So. Any other questions? You, you said the. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, you said that the, in November the peak value was 1100 or something like that. Right. What, what did it start at? Beginning of the year was at $13. But when, when it first started off? Oh, when it started off, the first transaction was someone bought a pizza for 10,000 bitcoins. <laughs> bought a single pizza for 10,000 of them. Yep. Then what is it currently? Around six, seven, six, seven hundred, somewhere in there. Six, six, sixty. Six, sixty. I've read that um, a lot of mathematicians' estimates are going to like. They say it's going to level out around twelve hundred, um, but there's some disagreement with that. What are the factors that go into their estimates? I have no idea. <laughs> I, I, didn't look, I didn't look at any of the value estimates or the economics of it at all. I cared about the math. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> when, it, when it comes down to it, what is actually worth the money? The, the, monetary time? the computational time. Computational. Right. It, it, it's the physical computation, or the actual energy input into computing these blocks. Right. This value, as I said, remember, it takes 10 minutes of a very large amount of computer time to find this. That's what's giving it value. Why did somebody originally say, hey, I'm going to give you money for that? Or what is somebody who originally paid money for it going to do with that? It, well, as I said, it took a long time for the currency to catch on, right? The first transaction was for 10,000 bitcoins for a pizza, right? And that was back in, I think, 2009, somewhere in there, uh, right? So if they held on to those 10,000 until 2013, <laughs> you know, that was roughly a $10 million pizza. I hope it was good. Well, there's also the guy in California who threw away a hard drive from 2010 that had a thousand of them on there. That actually brings me to my question. So one thing that's important about the currency is stability and value. And so there's no incentive for people to spend their bitcoins if they're going to increase in value like that. And so as a currency, if people aren't exchanging them, how is this going to actually work as a currency? Right? Why not just hold on to them because they're going to increase the value? Why spend them? On the flip side, why not spend them? Right? You, you, have, you, you put in some work now and you get something that's vastly more than the work you put in. Why not spend them on goods you could use now? That's, I mean, we don't look at our currency in that way, right? I mean, I, I'm paying somebody in dollars or I'm not paying them back in dollars. Because then here it could be worth a thousand times as much. Well, if you well, it's the difference between buying something and investing, right? Why why should you buy something now as opposed to invest all your money now? Right. That's what I'm saying. That's a good question. Right. I mean, there are lots of online realtors that are using this. Not lots, but oh no, quite a few. I, I huh? I don't think so, not yet, but I, I, you could probably find someone that may sell you a house for it, for enough of them. Most of the people I've heard own bitcoins, <coughs> people who uh, played the market, so that's a similar sort of thing. Well, there is a lot of that, but there are people who, who are using it as a currency, yeah, right? Yeah, just currency. Oh, the first time I ran into it is I was looking at a website, and they're like, yeah, and you can pay in bitcoin. I'm like, what are these things? And I looked and I'm like, I'm not paying six dollars a piece for those. <laughs> That's really what I said. They were six dollars at the time. Yes? So as the mining gain for mining bitcoins goes down, will that cause any problems with the security in general of the Bitcoin system? Because wouldn't less people start trying to mine? Right, um, but but then eventually there's also a transaction fee system I think that's going to kick into effect, um, so that there still will be incentive to mine. Right, so ba basically the, the, there, there's a way that they're always going to incentivize mining, so that you know it's it's worth your time. You mentioned there's a cap on the amount of Bitcoin that can exist. Yep. So what happens when that happens? It never actually hits the cap, because that's what. It was a pre it was a predetermined cap uh, the, in the design of the currency. There's a predetermined cap, I think, of 32 million. Oh, it's 21 million. Litecoin's 32 million. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and it will never reach that, right? Because mining will always pay out. Remember, it always it's it halves and halves and halves and halves, and so it never really gets there. You got kind of the whole motion is impossible thing, Zeno's paradox. So. And bitcoins are highly, highly divisible. They're divisible to at least eight decimal places, if not more. Um, things like that. Other questions? So sources, Wikipedia. Yes. <laughs> now, a quick moment.
What's the correct way to use Wikipedia as a source? You use it to find actual sources and to maybe get an idea of what something's like. So actual sources that you can find. The, act, the original paper, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Um, the other one that I used is Michael Nielsen actually has a very nice article on how the Bitcoin protocol works. Um, good chunks of this talk are based upon his ideas and discussions, uh, but he had nothing quite as nice as this. <laughs> and thank you, of course, to the honor students for being here today. Should we take the speaker? This seminar series continues every Friday at 4 30. So I invite you to continue to come in. An interesting talk, particularly when our students start talking. Come and give them a hard time. <laughs> 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 <laughs>